Thanks for tuning in to the Coffee with Kareem podcast. I am your host, Kareem Sirajuddin. Support this show today at patreon.com slash coffee with Kareem. Links are in every description of every show. Getting ready for Ramadan? We're going to have some special episodes to help enhance your spirituality and consciousness of the divine. Visit coffeewithkareem.com and leave us a lovely review on iTunes today. Today, I have a dear friend, Dr. Ahmed Zafran, on with me. Damn it! One second. <laughs> the bloopers behind the scenes. I love. I love. I love outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> I have with me today my good friend, Dr. Ahmed Zafran. He was born in Egypt and raised in Texas, and currently resides in the Bay Area in California. And he is an anesthesiologist by profession, an awesome dad. And today he's here to talk to me about this cutting edge new company he's starting with a team of fellow um, helpers in the field called Lucid Lane. Dr. Ahmed, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Kareem. It's an honor to be on and I've been listening to your show and your episodes for some time now. So it's really an honor to be uh, a guest on your show. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So I wanted to have you on today to discuss a very important issue. Um, there seems to be a particular type of epidemic in the United States today, specifically around addictions to painkillers, some ph- pharmaceutical drugs at large, but specifically, there is a painkiller um, epidemic uh, in the United States. Now, can you tell us more about what that means exactly? And as someone in the medical industry, what have you seen and what is currently being known and recognized by others in the in the field? Sure. So, you know, in the United States today, what we're finding is that more and more individuals are becoming dependent or even addicted to habit-forming medications. And habit-forming medications, there's a spectrum. Um, They include benzodiazepines. They include pain medications such as opioids. And what's happening is that a lot of people, uh, for one reason or another, whether it's an injury, chronic pain, from you know debilitating illnesses, or even accidental dependence as a result of being put on these medications for a surgical procedure, or if they had been on some sort of therapy and were placed on these medications um, as a temporizing measure, somehow, some way, um, they got lost within the gaps. And now these these unfortunate folks have uh, some sort of dependency or even addiction to these medications as, as a result. Mm-hmm. So what are the numbers of people who go get treatment, let's say for cancer or otherwise, and then they're on some of these medications and the cancer has gone? Um, how often are people actually still using uh, these medications or painkillers uh, post-treatment? And why is that an issue for some? Well, that's a great question. What, you know, there's, there's various data collected by the Center for Disease Control and uh, the World Health Organization, some of the numbers that are really, um, you know, awe-inspiring are how many people are addicted to these medications and actually die for uh, being on prescription-type medications unnecessarily. So up to 200 individuals die as a result of these habit-forming medications, 200 individuals per day um, die from this epidemic. And that's not to say that some of, you know, some people need to be on these types of medications transiently, but the epidemic is as a result of people being on these types of medications unnecessarily becoming dependent and eventually addicted and having life altering, um, and sometimes even death results as, as a result of it. Wow. That's pretty serious. So, what happens in a case like this? I mean, does a person still get that prescription through their doctor or does the prescription um, cease because treatment has now taken place? I mean, are these people just left hanging looking for alternatives or they are still able to get these medications through their health insurance and keep taking them even though it's really out of dependency? Well, that question really speaks to the crux of the problem. We don't want to, you know, stigmatize Uh, individuals for being on pain medications that they absolutely need to be on. That said, you know, what happens is that people do fall through the gaps. And I can give you a a concrete example. If somebody comes to the the hospital 
maybe middle-aged or elderly individual who broke their hip. And as a result of that, you know, they need to have surgery to repair their hip. They more than likely will be placed on some sort of opioid or pain uh, medication to help them through the acute or the initial symptoms and pain um, to get them through that surgery. So their orthopedic surgeon or the, top, or the doctor who's taking care of them may prescribe them these types of medications for the short term, but they may be lost through the process in follow-up or they you know, may have some tendencies that make them more dependent or addicted to these types of medications. And then the follow-up doesn't happen the way that it's scheduled to be. You know, life happens. People don't make it to their follow-up appointment. And to be totally honest, some doctors um, are contributing to the problem. And this is being acknowledged across the field of medicine. You know, more and more doctors are learning, but some simply just don't have the tools necessary to know when to stop these medications, how to wean their patients off of these medications, and how to do it in a safe way. Right. So one of the things I'm taking away from this is that obviously there are situations where these types of medications are necessary for treatment, and sometimes people slip through the cracks or may have personality traits which make them more prone to addiction. Um, but doctors generally are really good at identifying what medicine you need and prescribing that medicine, but they're not necessarily equipped to help people taper off of it at the right time or in the long term. Is that correct? I think that's very accurate. You know, in medical school and in, you know, individual spe specific residency training, we become very adept and become experts at prescribing medications. But in terms of de-prescribing and knowing when to take patients off of these types of medications and how to do it in a systematic manner that, you know, serves the patients well and is done in a way with empathy and compassion and understanding the overall life circumstances, you know, there's an art to that. And um, that's an art that we're hoping to fill, fulfill and do in a way that helps not just a few people, but help put a dent in this opioid epidemic that's really ravaging our country. Inshallah. No, this is very important. So bring it, let's bring it now to Lucid Lean. So the vision of Lucid Lean is to do just this. Why don't you tell us more about the team that's come together so far and what's everybody bringing to the table? Sure. So Lucid Lane is a company that was formed uh, in 2017, summer of 2017. And it's a very diverse group um, who came together uh, Co-founders include a psychiatrist, Dr. Khan from Stanford, who also is running his own private practice in psychiatry, um, in addition to that child and adolescent medicine or child and adolescent psychiatry. And uh, an another co-founder who is a seasoned entrepreneur here in, in the Silicon Valley, um, Mr. Adnan Asar. The three of us, we, we came together and we said, how can we really address this problem of the opioid and habit-forming you know, crisis in the United States in a way that, you know, doesn't lean on these types of medications, but actually introduces some behavioral health and expertise in tapering these people off of these medications. So what we've done is we've, cre we've created a team that includes the three of us, but also health coaches, recovery coaches, um, supplemental material that includes mindfulness, cognitive behavior therapy, and we've we've kind of taken on the the um, ideology based on the research of Dr. Anna Lemke out of Stanford University, um, where behavioral science techniques early on can help prevent folks from going from dependence to addiction and actually break the cycle at a very early stage. Excellent. So let's walk us through what it would be like for a person who signs up for this Lucid Lane program. What's going to happen for me if I'm seeking this um, support or, or treatment? Sure. So basically what, what happens is either a primary care physician or some sort of health professional, could be a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner, sometimes a healthcare provider will refer somebody that they're working with who is struggling with these habit-forming medications. But a lot of our, our clients actually find us on the internet through Google searches or through different advertisements that they found. And you know, once they've identified that this is something that they want help with, they reach out to us and we have a staff clinical coordinator 
who listens very intently to what the issue is. Um, that may be an issue of, you know, benzodiazepine. I'm struggling with sleep. I'm struggling with anxiety. I'm on these types of medications. And I really just feel dependent on them. I feel like, you know, there are certain aspects of my life that have taken a toll or have taken a hit. And um, I'd like help with that. So our clinical coordinator will work with, with them to kind of get gather all of the information and discuss a program that we design and tailor just for that person. Um, what that program looks like then is the clinical coordinator, based on the information given, will assign and and uh, will assign a health coach who will be kind of that person's comrade. That person will work with them daily, um, based on you know two-way text messaging. That's HIPAA compliant. Um, or via video conferencing, or even just by phone calls as they go through the program. And we embed some of those other techniques that we talked about through the program that's measured week by week. Excellent. So this is a um, long-term process. You know, generally it takes how long, would you say? Is it depend on the case, or is there kind of an overall program, like a six-month or three-month program to do this? That's an excellent question. I think that what we've been conditioned to thinking is that we can solve things very quickly in life. You know, quick fix, you know, this is my problem, this is a quick solution. And the reality is, is that it's much more nuanced and much more challenging than that. If it were easy to fix, then we wouldn't have this epidemic and this problem today. So what we do is we, we create a program with the client um, at the center of the program. We don't employ a paternalistic type of methodology where we said, this is what you're going to do and this is how you're going to do it. On the contrary, you know, we, we try to base our protocol on empathy, compassion, and at the rate and style that the individual suffering from this dependence is going through. They get to kind of, you know, move at the pace that they want. And we create the structure um, where, where they can have the ability to do that successfully. It's usually more than a few months, you know, as, as you know, these, the, this personalized tapering protocol goes into effect and is managed by that person's primary care provider. We create it and we serve as an extension to the primary care provider so that that establishes a strengthening of the patient physician relationship. But what we do is we say, okay, we're monitoring your, your, your symptoms, your withdrawal symptoms as we taper off of this. We get daily feedback through digital technology, um, daily digital feedback. And based on that, we determine how fast and how appropriate or if we need to go into a holding pattern. It all depends on the individual and how well they're doing with the taper. And we move accordingly. So, for example, if somebody is, you know, experiencing anxiety or sleeplessness um, as a result of the taper and they reach out to us, one of our coach coaches will immediately reach out to them and perhaps even provide supplemental uh, information such as a link to mindfulness or a referral for cognitive behavior therapy. The idea here is to nip the problem before it becomes uh, a, a a larger issue for them and to help them get through those moments of struggle and weakness so that together we're on a road to recovery where the person doesn't feel alone throughout the process. Right. Now, for those listening, what, what are some of the medical conditions that tend to require these types of medications? Um, and what, what should we know now if, let's say, we just found out that we have cancer or that somebody we know has one of these chronic illnesses that will require these types of medications? What should we know about what you're talking about now? And how do we maybe prevent it from happening if, let's say, the doctor is already um, prescribed me these medications or I've been on it for a couple of months? What should that person know in your opinion? Well, these types of medications are being prescribed by a wide and diverse range of providers. And, you know, medications such as benzodiazepines um, include, you know, people know the word Ativan. 
Um, on the opioid side, you know, things like uh, Norco or Vicodin are kind of popular in terms of what's said in the media. And these medications are often administered or prescribed, excuse me, um, for, for instance, the benzos for anxiety, um, uneasiness, sleeplessness. Sometimes, you know, people are using them incorrectly as sleeping aids because they have an underlying condition of anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder or whatever it might be that's causing them unease. What will end up happening is they'll go to a clinician and perhaps be prescribed, you know, that type of anti-anxiety medication. And rather than dealing with the underlying issue, you know, the problems in their life or the circumstances that they've gone through that are leading to them having these feelings of anxiety and depression and, and, and so forth, rather than addressing those, we're kind of masking the problem with these types of medications. On the opioid side, you know, oftentimes patients are prescribed these types of medications because they've had some sort of traumatic incident, sometimes um, a broken leg or a broken arm, whatever it might be, or they may have chronic pain as a result of conditions such as, you know, rheumatoid arthritis. And some of these medications, you know, you, you go with, you know, non-opioid type medications and they're just not getting the relief that they need. And sometimes clinicians will prescribe them an opioid type medication. And that may, you know, without proper management may lead to dependence and ultimately addiction. So this isn't just a matter of, oh, the person's just being weak or they're lacking willpower, you know, because sometimes people may still have some of those ideas around somebody being addicted or dependent on a drug. Now, why is it not that simple from, from your knowledge? Right. And, and, and part of the mission is to break that stigma. Um, you know, we, we, we're, we're kind of in a, in a situation right now where there's a lot of shame around being on these types of medications. And as a result, people are hiding that they're on them and not getting the help that they need. Now, I'm not an advocate or um, an absolutionist in the sense that we need to get everybody off of these medications and that they serve no purpose at all. I think that's, I think that's counterintuitive, and I think that um, it's not really a part of the, the long-term solution. Now, on the contrary, I do think that they have merit when um, prescribed appropriately, but the management and the follow-up has to become exponentially better. So what I'd say is, is that, you know, these medications can and are appropriate in certain circumstances, but as long-term solutions and fixes for underlying medical conditions and problems, we have to be better about tapering off of these medications. We have to be better in terms of having a better relationship between clinicians and patients. And lastly, we need to be better about, you know, our judgmental attitudes. There's no, there's no reason that we shouldn't be having better conversations around this topic and working together towards solutions rather than marginalization and further stigma and shame around something that most times people don't have control over. Um, dependence and addiction is not a matter of willpower. It's a matter of getting the help at the appropriate time by the appropriate means and doing so in a structured uh, fashion. Right. It's very similar to, you know, when people, let's say, are against pharmaceuticals for in, in the field of mental health or psychiatry, like, oh, I don't believe in psychiatry and, and medication. And I always tell people, look, that you can't have that extreme opinion either, because in some cases, it's necessary to be prescribed medication if you have schizophrenia or clinical depression or the likes. But at the same time, you have to be doing parallel to that the inner work. You know, it can help stabilize you so that you can start functioning and getting that deeper work done. But it's certainly not a solution if, um, let's say, in a case of clinical depression where you don't actually get some CBT or, you know, meditation or exercise or whatever it is that's part of your lifestyle, which may also be um, facilitating some of that depression, right? It's, it's in some cases, it's not just biochemical. It's, it could be that plus experiences or lifestyle adjustments that haven't yet been realized. So similarly, it sounds like this is uh, also, 
the case when it comes to the medical industry, um, specifically around these types of medications. Absolutely. And I think you touched on a lot of important aspects there. And at the, at the foundation of the solution is going to be trust, you know, um, whether it's pharmaceutical companies who are trying to fulfill a bottom line or what, you know, clinicians prescribing medications and seeing as many patients as they can in the clinic. You know, there are a lot of factors that go into trust. But at the end of the day, if we're having better conversations, if we establish a kind of like a circle of trust, sometimes that expands beyond the patient um, physician relationship, but expands beyond that to what our community has to say about these medications, what the community has to say about the recovery process, what it means to be, you know, to be ill and what the road to recovery looks like. Um, if we don't have a foundation of trust within all of those aspects, people are going to be skeptical. And I think justly and fairly so. So, you know, my goal is to, you know, to, to create an environment that leads to recovery, that empowers individuals to overcome whatever kind of dependence that they may be expressing um, or, or be feeling, and to do it in a way that allows them to trust the process, to trust the individual, and to ultimately to trust themselves, that they have the power within them with the right guidance and structure to overcome the adversity that's going on in their lives. If we can do that and base it in addition with evidence-based medicine in a way that, that allows the community also to come together and be supportive, I really think we can make a big dramatic change um, you know, with this crisis. It's going to take a lot of work, but my goal is to do this address this problem before people move on to the dependence or addicted stage, but to actually help them earlier on so that we don't have any issues of accidental dependence where it's unnecessarily becoming an issue for many people. Right. Yeah. And as someone who's also experienced in addiction and specifically sexual addiction, um, I know that any type of uh, recovery from addiction has a lot of similar milestones and themes. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted you to come on today is to talk about Lucid Lean and what it has to offer because I think overall we definitely are lacking an awareness of the recovery process around addictions and that sometimes we find ourselves addicted or dependent on things even though we were never quote unquote real drug addicts before right it could have just been a uh, an outcome of getting treatment for an actual disease or disorder that I had and now I find myself in this place of constant need of medication. So I'm really, you know, proud of you and your team for coming together and trying to ad address this issue from this this standpoint and uh I think it's I think it's really wonderful and I'm and I'm glad you came on to give us more knowledge about what this is all about and that it's an actual problem in the country of of the United States. Um is this something that you also are aware you find data on in other parts of the world, like in Europe, are they facing similar uh, challenges or is it more so in America because we definitely have perhaps a larger market for pharmaceutical drugs? Do you know anything about what this epidemic looks like outside of the United States? Yes. I mean, this epidemic has, has, has touched every country in the world. Um, and although the, the culprits or the usual suspects may differ slightly, um, these types of medications or these classes, such as benzodiazepines and um, opioids. Um, and then there are also some medications, some classes of medications that deal more on the psychiatry side um, as well. But they've touched, you know, every country, every, every country on the planet, you know, even in the Middle East. Um, you know, we look at Egypt in particular, um, the world famous, you know, football or soccer star Mohamed Salah, you know, is a part of a campaign in Egypt and North Africa and also sub-Saharan Africa that's dealing directly with the opioid crisis occurring on that continent in those countries. Really? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. There is a, there's a medication called Tramadol that's become very widespread and used, um, in Egypt in particular, and it's becoming a huge problem 
um, with with in, the youth and elderly folks. You know, it's 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 becoming a huge issue enough where the government is is working on campaigns and utilizing celebrity status to to help destigmatize and help get people off of those types of medications as well. So this is a global problem. This isn't an isolated problem to the United States. Um, this is something that's that has to be addressed globally. And you know the 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 approach that we're trying to have is we're trying to move away from you know the one-on-one -on -one therapist. We're trying to design this product that allows us to reach hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people um, at the same time. And that in, in effect will allow us to help people anywhere at any time, whether they're in Egypt or South Africa or in the UK, the United States, Mexico, it won't matter. As humans, we have a universal bond and brotherhood. We, you know, we are plagued by the same problems in essence. And I think if we put our minds together and put the right means in place, um, this is something that we can help millions of people across the world with, inshallah. Inshallah. That's amazing, man. So, so Lucid Lean is capable of serving human beings outside of the United States. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Excellent. And, and also, like the other thing that came up for me while you were sharing about this, what's going on in Egypt, for example, which I, I didn't know, um, is it's almost like there's a legal drug addiction happening in so many nations. And just because it's legal, sometimes we overlook that it still could be wrong or harmful and not good for people, right? It's kind of like, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, alcohol isn't a drug, right? It's like, actually, it is considered a drug, but it's legal and it's socially acceptable in the United States. So we sometimes don't see it as um, detrimental as, let's say, being addicted to cocaine or crystal meth, right? Just because you can buy it at the store, but it's still something that can lead to an addiction, um, and just because it can be legally purchased doesn't take away from the potential harm it has. And similarly, would you say that's another way to understand some of these pharmaceutical drugs and dependency when it gets to that point? Yes, I do. Um, you know, you, you, you gave the example of alcohol, and we know that in the United States alone, you know, millions of people are dying regularly as a result of driving under the influence of alcohol, as a result of you know, comorbidities or other diseases that, ar that arise from alcohol addiction or dependence, such as liver failure. Um, you know, these are, these are things that are, that are maybe indirectly associated with alcohol, but are, are a direct result of alcohol consumption. Now, that might be a legal substance to consume in the United States, but, you know, recent studies have shown that any amount of alcohol can be detrimental to the human body. So it's not a matter of legality and, and non-legality. Um, when we look at things from a standpoint of medicine and science, we look at what the substance can do to the body, how the body reacts to it, and beyond that, what the socioeconomic status uh, or, or issues that arise um, as a result of it. And what we found is that these habit-forming medications, they can, you know, when used inappropriately for, you know, time periods that are not appropriate, they can ruin families, they can lead to divorce, they can cause instability, you know, in relationships. So it's, it's if, we, if we address it and take away the stigma um, and the, the nuances of whether it's legal or not, what is it doing? to me? What is it doing to my family? How is it affecting my life? If we come to those terms and not feel judged about it and feel that there are those out there who can help us deal with it in an appropriate way, I think we'll find a lot of solutions. Inshallah. Now, Dr. Ahmed, what are some of the signs um, that we as families, as friends should be aware of um, to maybe, because maybe some of us aren't, we don't know if our relative or our friend may actually be addicted or starting to become dependent on some of these pharmaceuticals. We may just think, well, they're getting it from the doctor and they take it every day. But how do we start to know um, if there could be a problem? You know, what are some of the prerequisites or advice you would give people out there um, who may need to consider visiting Lucid Lane? 
That's a, that's a really great question. I'm glad that you brought that up. You know, those who are closest to you, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, see patterns. And as humans and animals and mammals, you know, we have patterns of behavior. So anything out of the ordinary from the usual pattern of behavior, um, such as, you know, withdrawing from others and social events, um, you know, going to remote places um, at inopportune times, seeing some addiction type um, uh, tendencies like gambling or drinking or going out late at night unexpectedly. Um, you know, those, those are some of the behavioral signs that sometimes we see in these types of medications. Um, what we also see are withdrawal symptoms because sometimes people don't have access to these medications as much as that they need them because they're becoming dependent on them. So some of the withdrawal symptoms are actually some of the key indicators that we look for. And that can include um, anxiety, it can include depression, it can include you know, sweating profusely, um, irritability, sleeplessness. These are, you know, sometimes these things may seem as vague, but when there's an acute change in someone's normal behavioral patterns, um, and they were already dealing with, you know, some sort of chronic pain or underlying anxiety. Um, these are some of the withdrawal symptoms that we look for and see. And oftentimes, you know, clients who contact us, you know, they, they're very honest about what they're going through. And a lot of it is big picture stuff. They'll say, I feel like my I feel like I'm not in control of my emotions. I feel like I'm unable to focus at work. I feel like I'm unable to be attentive with my wife or my husband or my children. I feel like I can have explosive anger and rage. And I really just want a change. So, you know, when they go to their primary care doctor or whoever has been kind of helping them with these types of symptoms and medications, you know, an unexperienced person will say, just cut it cold turkey, right? And we'll hear this in the community as well. Just, you know, just cut it off and, 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 you know, you'll be fine. Just have some willpower and you'll be fine. And that is really, really bad advice and dangerous as well. You know, this is not something where, you know, as a population, as a society, we should be thinking about just uh, cutting off cold turkey because one, it doesn't work, <laughs> right? That's, that's a big thing. But two is that the withdrawal symptoms can be dangerous, right? Depending on the types of medications that you're on. So if you're on a specific type of benzodiazepine and you cut it off cold turkey, there's potential for side effects like seizures. Um, so it's not something that should be taken um, haphazardly or lightly. This needs to be a structured approach based on evidence-based medicine infused with empathy, compassion, love, understanding in a non-judgmental way. This is the human element that I think is lacking. If we, if we have a, a comprehensive approach that includes all of these facets, um, I'm one to be optimistic and a believer in this approach. And I would also add that if we were really trying to follow Islamic values or etiquettes, then we also recognize that gradualism is exactly one of the principles that was found in the seerah of the prophet the prophetic mission and the history, right sorry sudden so for example was alcohol banned in the first year of his mission no it was banned like 12 or 13 years in even after the five daily prayers was established right and the five daily prayers wasn't established until about 10 11 years in so this shows us that even in the early muslim community Alcohol, which was a big part of the society at the time, wasn't, uh, it had to be gradually removed, right? And so similarly, if we really want to follow Islam, we also have to recognize that there is a wise method or process to removing certain ills or bad habits in a society or a person. I couldn't agree with you more. And, and just to add to that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely no Islamic scholar, but what I would say is that from my own practice of, of Islam and trying to incorporate some of those practices into my, my daily work as a physician, um, one thing that I've learned from the seerah of Prophet Muhammad is 
he was approachable. He he lent an ear. He would address people. He would he would look at them and he would have his whole body facing them when they would be speaking to him about whatever kind of calamity or whatever kind of issues that may be going on in their life. And he wouldn't, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, turn his body away from them until that they were done. And, you know, there are layers of meaning to that that speak to me as a physician in that we need to be present with each other. We need to be, you know, active listeners. We need to be careful about being preachy with others, you know, putting ourselves in their shoes, realizing that we all have our own struggles, whether it be medical, mental, spiritual, emotional, we all have our own individual struggles. So we should be gradual in our process, but we should be direct and honest with each other. And we should be definitely exuding a feeling of honor, compassion, empathy, trust that that shouldn't ring hollow. You know, people know when you're being superficial. So I think, you know, based on the Islamic code of ethics and and basing that upon the guidance of, of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, this is not something that that we should take lightly. If if we're going to use this code of ethics, it should be universal for anybody who comes to seek assistance and help. We should do that simply because it's the right thing to do. And doing what's right will bring trust from, from everybody, whether they come from a Muslim background or not. Ultimately, as human beings, we want to have a universal code of, of love, empathy, to make sure that it's backed by sound evidence and honesty and literature. If we do all of those things, I think we'll at least be honest with ourselves in the journey and with the program that we're trying to put forward. Dr. Ahmed, thank you so much for enlightening us about this project and this um, problem that's happening around us in our society. And, and it's great that you have a team that's coming together to actually address this. Don't forget to visit lucidlane.com, ladies and gentlemen, to learn more information, ask questions. They're very supportive and responsive. Uh, check out their programs. Don't forget to refer coffee with kareem when you do uh visit lucid lane or sign up for their program and dr ahmed thanks again for coming on to the coffee with kareem podcast it's my pleasure thank you for the opportunity thanks for tuning in to the coffee with kareem podcast i am your host kareem sirajuddin support this show today at patreon.com slash coffee with kareem links are in every description of every show getting ready for ramadan we're going to have some special episodes to help enhance your spirituality and consciousness of the divine visit coffeewithkareem.com and leave us a lovely review on itunes today